Hey, what's up? Lee Ron here. Thank you for joining me. In today's video, it's going to be a simple, straightforward painting process from light to dark of this parrot. I love birds. It's a great subject. It's one that allows you a lot of freedom. So if you're, even if your drawings are shaky or something like that, you can get it uh, pretty accurately and it will still look good. Uh, and I want to explore the idea of using individual paints as much as possible. So you will see me using mostly individual reds, yellows, blues, and then doing some kind of a mix for the background, but still maintaining a lot of visible singular shapes there, uh, color paints there, and I think a lot of the beauty comes from that nice balance of allowing every paint to truly shine. And in that great grand scheme of things, it will work beautifully together. So let's get to it. So as always, I'm going to start with laying in the basic lines for the drawing. Now you'll notice I'm actually starting with straight lines, which I don't often do. Uh, but because the parrot has such a well defined shape, I felt like I could get the proportions of some of the key dots uh, first before I put in the curved line. So like where the side of the right side of the head intersects with the left and the beak and everything, uh, which is why I started with kind of the, an overall flat lines shape. Uh, now I did have to adjust some shapes like the, win the wing that you see here, uh, but I'm keeping my drawing fairly loose at this point. Uh, and I actually like the idea of painting over a loose sketch. Uh, I find that it helps in removing a lot of the pressure uh, from the process. And now we're on to the painting stage. Uh, sorry, I went real uh, time lapse on the drawing. I know some people just don't enjoy it as much, so we kind of skipped uh, wanted to run it fast, but uh, you can just rewind it and rewatch it. It's, it's actually pretty straight, straightforward in this example. So I'm starting here from top to bottom with the red. Now this red is quite muted uh, on the picture as well. Even and I, and I spoke uh, to you about this a lot in the past that nature doesn't have too many naturally super saturated colors. And even with this parrot, it's very affected by the light and shadow conditions. So none of the colors are really that bright. Uh, it's very rare to see a lot of bright colors and we have a tendency to paint the red super rich red and then the yellow super rich yellow and the blue super rich blue and then the background just pure green that's very in your face. Uh, and that can lead to a very amateurish look. It really depends on style and execution. You can do it in a way that isn't amateurish looking, but you do run the risk. So something to be aware of. Now, here's what I'm doing here. I'm treating this first uh, wash of the feathers uh, as the lightest value that you see. So for example, top of the wing, look at how light of a red I'm using. Uh, I'm going really light because I will put some shadows on it. Uh, and I want to make sure that uh, I leave room for that, right? Uh, next thing I'm putting the yellow. Now some of these are going to end up drying a little too light, which often can happen. As uh, so we will see me later on going over a dark, bro uh, darker layer. Uh, but what is important is the individual paints. Uh, and I know a lot of people are scared of it. Like what will happen if I put my blue next to my yellow? Will it turn green? As long as the level of wetness is kind of equal, and you leave enough room for the individual paints to show, it's not going to completely blend. So you'll notice here the blue really maintains its space uh, and the yellow maintains its space. The paper is not angled too strongly, so you get a medium amount of flow uh, and things do tend to work out okay. So don't worry about that too much uh, because I do hear a lot of people are scared of that, but do allow the paints, every color to have a room to breathe. It really is important. Even this red touching the blue won't be too terrible, you know. Uh, so yeah, the colors I'm using, again, you can see the overlay and hopefully that is helpful. Manganese blue hue for the cooler blue, then fr French ultramarine for both the warmer blue, but al and also to kind of neutralize the temperature, but also it's easier to go dark with it. So I'm using it as a means of darkening my paint. And then we got Perlin Red as kind of my cooler red, uh, cooler to slightly neutral, and then Pyro Scarlet is the fiery red, Indian yellow. And you will see me using some of that neutral black by Kohinoor. Uh, every color is different brand here, by the way. Manganese blue is Daniel Smith. Uh, French ultramarine is uh, also Daniel Smith, I believe. Perlin Red and Pyro Scarlet. Uh, are both Daniel Smith too. Indian yellow is White Knights and the neutral black is Kohinoor again. Uh, and you will see me use it for the background. 
Um, and even for the background, look at the, the reference photo. You can see the black and then you can see the greens and yellows really showing themselves. Uh, so that's one thing that I will try and maintain. Uh, some of the individual colors showing in the background as well. You just It's all a matter of balance. If you have a lot of individual bright colors up front, maybe balance it out with slightly darkening, neutralizing and so on and graying out the background colors okay so now we're gonna let this uh, dry once I put in some wet and wet to get that beautiful small branch kind of look uh, we're gonna make sure we don't have too many of these awkward gaps here uh, I'm very abstract with the shape of the uh, legs of uh, the parrot uh, that's a macaque I think I'm not sure what how you pronounce it but yeah I'm just gonna call it a parrot uh, and look at the the beak now. I'm going to kind of blend it in. I don't remember if I do wet and wet at this point. Uh, I think it's going to happen in the next wash, yeah. Uh, and a bit of red to that uh, white spot to the right next to the eye uh, because it's actually affected by the feathers around it. That's what you get by reflected light. Uh, all the light in the scene influences every different piece of it. Uh, now we go over the first wash that I told you before it's gonna be the lightest version of the color with the shadows so now we're gonna establish form and three-dimensionality as best as we can uh, I find that reds tend to be very um, uh, hard to predict uh, how they're gonna dry especially these pyroly kind of paints um, I'm actually I should look for a more reliable version maybe something more alizarin uh, the problem is, again, Alizarin's um, light fastness isn't so good naturally, so who knows. Uh, I'm trying to get the random pattern for the feathers. Gone a bit on a... Uh, there is a bit too much of a pattern here, but uh, overall here I'm breaking it off a bit. Uh, and it will read well in the grand scheme of things. The patterns are created by um, combining a lot of the light and shadow. I don't go like small, small brush marks one by one by one doing tens of those. No, I'm just putting in a few key ones. And look at how I figured it was too light. So here I am darkening as a base and then putting on top of that again, those indications for the darker shadows, uh, for the feathers, the shadows in between the feathers. And hopefully that'll work out. I need this stronger uh, thicker paint for it to last because remember there's water not only in the palette but also on paper once you put a wash when you do wet and wet and also in the brush and it's all all of these are things you have to take into consideration now off to the bottom part which is quite dark you'll notice significantly darker um, and I want to start establishing that here if possible um, and then we got some nice little feathery patterns on the head as well and from there we will move on to the wing now this is tricky again the feathers on the wing side are really visible so try and figure out the pattern which is these beautiful rounded shapes and just throw it in there try not to repeat it not to create too much again of a repetitive pattern because that will feel very inorganic and unnatural uh, but you also want to get a few very clear feathers in there, right? Now, here I noticed that my yellow is way too weak, so I'm actually going to come back with more yellow, put another wash on it. It just didn't look good enough for me. Now, it could have been actually me worrying about the blue, because the blue is should be much, much darker, of course. Uh, and you see how seeing, once you add a darker paint, you see everything in a new context. The blue looked dark when we finished the first wash, and now it's super light. Uh, so I'm going over everything, coming back with a wet brush. If you feel like you're seeing too many dry brush marks or individual lines, just come back with a bit of water and help it move together. Sometimes I'll even use, uh, <laughs> just talking, it showed up the uh, hair sprayer, oh, hair sprayer, a uh, water sprayer to get this kind of a... Uh, um, flowy motion to help everything spread out a bit and not to be too prominent. Uh, so now I'm mixing that darker blue mix. Um, it's a little too much French ultramarine, uh, but I had to because I wanted to get it darker. And once again, the manganese blue hue is just lighter naturally. Now there is a solution to that, by the way, if you want to still use a light paint because it's the best color you can find, um, and it's too light, you just turn the entire painting into a lighter key painting. Uh, so change all the values um, respectively. So make the blue lighter, but then make the yellow lighter and make the background lighter. You see what I mean? Skip Lawrence does this really well and I did review his book. So you can check out Skip Lawrence watercolor book review and you'll see it. 
Um, I forgot the name of the book, but it's excellent. And uh, he shows it really, really well. Um, you just turn everything high key and suddenly the colors are... Because every color has an ideal value point. If you go darker than that, you start to lose the saturation. It's just a part of painting with watercolor. Um, so anyway, moving on to the bottom parts here. And it was very important for me to show that strong red down there. And, and I'll also add in a bit of blue, but especially the red, because it is kind of buried in there, in the shadows on the tail. Uh, and that looks really beautiful, and that contrast of warm and cool um, is really nice. Now, you may want to curve it back a bit, because it's in the bottom peripherals of the painting. Uh, so it really is a balancing act. And, and remember, you can fix those mistakes, quote-unquote, immediately if you catch them, just by putting charging back with more paint or lifting back, right? You have a lot of ways of fixing mistakes in real time, um, which, which are easier if you catch it in real time and the drier the paint gets, of course, it gets a little uh, tougher, uh, but still quite doable. I think. Uh, so now I'm starting to put some finishing touches on the wings, on the on the parrot itself, before we start moving on to the background. Now the background is what's really going to make the bird pop, and that's something you have to remember. Right now it's a clear, kind of clean, illustrative look. If you want to get that realism, you have to bring every value to the right place. And the more accurate you are, the more realistic, or let's say the more similar to the reference photo it's going to look. Because some reference photos, even though they're photos, they still look unrealistic, trust me, uh, because the colors are a little strange. Uh, so now I mix and I make sure that I mix enough, enough paint because we need a lot, okay? So I like to use, actually it's very funny, I like to use the black and the Indian yellow and I find that together they look a little green without adding any blue. I don't know if it's the black has naturally more blue in it, but somehow it ends up working. As long as you show a bit of the yellow, uh, individually, I find it works really well. Now, one thing I'm very aware of is not to take my time too much around the head because then you get these weird halos around where you took your time with the paint and it started drying unevenly. You don't want that. I'm really looking to move the paint properly here. I think I also increased the angle of paper to something like 20, maybe even 25 degrees, uh, which usually it's like 10 or 15. Uh, just to help the paint move a little downwards. Now here you see me put in a little bit more of that beautiful um, uh, Indian yellow. It's very opaque, so it, it sometimes will show even above the black color, uh, at least while it's wet. Once it dries, things kind of tend to settle. And look at how much it makes the bird pop immediately. It also sheds some light, <laughs> quote, uh, like in a, in a funny uh, parenthesis or however you want to phrase it, on our mistakes in the bird. So if we go very dark on the background, suddenly we see where we didn't go dark enough on the bird. Now, remember what I told you earlier, you can turn everything high key. So in theory, had I painted the background lighter, you wouldn't have noticed as much uh, the need to darken some parts on the bird itself. Okay, and also some parts we just haven't darkened yet because we haven't gotten to it. So for example, the details around the beak uh, should be darker and we just haven't gotten around to do it yet. Okay, now I'm adding a bit of French ultramarine there to the mix just to make it more interesting near the bottom. Uh, and I'm very aware of the level of wetness on paper. Remember, when when you take a bit of a break to mix, the, the paint on paper starts to dry and you have to come back with slightly thicker paint or work fast or more water. It's, it just gets more complex. You want to work as fast as necessary, but don't go too fast because then it's hard to control it. Uh, so always find your balance that way. Um, to me, it's about working as fast as necessary, but as slowly as possible in that kind of spectrum. Uh, and look at how beautiful the everything will just pop. Uh, the, tr the Not tree trunk, it's not a trunk, but just the branch. Uh, and all of the beautiful details on the feathers down below, uh, which should be, again, darker. We will darken them later on. It's too light and the, the background really makes it obvious. Um, but yeah, a very fun process. I'm, I'm very much fond of processes that have uh, a major element in the foreground and then a nice muted background. It's darker. I love it. And I find that these subjects are good for beginners too um, because you get a very quick win. All you have to really establish is that object in the front and the background. It's very good with still life especially. If you're tackling a scene, cityscape, nature, it has a bit more complexity to it. Uh, in my opinion. And then you really need to 
get a kind of blueprint of how to paint and what to do in every stage. And I, I'm, I don't like it as much. Now you'll notice I left a couple of light gaps around. That's not good. It looks weird. It sticks out. So I'm covering them up. Um, and yes, I'm kind of losing the flow because I'm covering it up after the background is dried. But because the background is so dark, it doesn't matter. This will kind of blend in seamlessly. You will see. And I'm using this opportunity also to adjust the shape. If I see that I got something a little off, uh, the feathers don't feel organic enough or something like that, I can adjust it. Um, and then some areas need a little darkening. Uh, the paints aren't as vibrant and that's kind of a given. You can't always force the, the paints to be as vibrant as the uh, original. Here, look at what I'm doing here. This is interesting. I'm putting in a significantly dark wash and then coming back with a moist brush uh, to help it kind of move around a bit. And that will give us that beautiful shadow on the front of the beak. Now notice how it blended a little too much, which is um, to be expected. So I'm going back uh, and putting in darker and darker paint onto the center there. And, and that's uh, a good way to achieve that blended transition that I really like. And sorry about the bell. Sorry about the barks. I'm actually going to continue recording as long as you can hear me. Usually I'll pause at this stage, but uh, because we got some uh, order coming in. Uh, and, but you see, I'm, I, I continue putting in that wet and wet for as long as I see it necessary um, to to have that center point darker. If it's not dark enough, I'll continue darkening it more and more and more and more. Um, just to make sure that you can really feel that shape of the beak. That's the most important part here. Um, because it is rounded and it's actually one of the single, like the only rounded elements uh, in the scene when you think about it. Everything else is kind of sharp with the uh, feathery texture and the, the contrast of the background and foreground. That's really the only indication of a round object we have. Uh, so anyway, now onto the last kind of passing over the feathers, uh, because now I'm close to maybe overdoing it. Uh, but trust me, when you look at this from, from a bit of a distance, you will see everything. And it's funny because, because it's a small piece, you need to really look at it at a bit of a distance to see all the nuances. Uh, but yeah, we do need to indicate some more shadows on the, on the branch. That's really obvious if you look at the reference photo. It's way too light. Uh, and also on the feathers themselves. Uh, we'll start indicating some more of the darker shadows, fixing in that shape of the branch. Uh, signing it and I will add a few corrections afterwards that I notice uh, that sometimes something that will happen. Uh, again, this needs darkening. Just if you compare the blue to the yellow, look at how much darker it is in comparison. Okay, look at the uh, relative value. Okay, value is very contextual. It's very relative. Um, and it's just something to, to have in mind. You don't only want to ask yourself, okay, is this dark enough? Is this light enough? Is this too dark? Is this too light? Also look at and compare different areas and ask yourself, did I go super dark with the background but very light on the feathers? Did I go the other way around? Is the parrot too dark and the background doesn't show enough, you know? Um, now this red, this yellow felt not too strong, not strong enough. So I, I'm actually going back with some opaque, as opaque as possible uh, yellow. And I actually like that it's mixed with a bit of blue just to really bring out some shine into the focal point in a way. I could have done it with the red too. Uh, and now once it's dried, I think it really settled nicely and it looks good. We're going to remove the tape, show you the final result. Uh, the picture will show it in, in, in clearer colors because the my camera really uh, dulls down the colors sometimes. But in any case, yeah, this is it for this one. I hope you enjoyed it. So thank you so much for uh, watching. I really do hope you enjoyed it. Um, and just like the previous painting, there's a bit of a brush hair there. Just like the previous painting that I did show you of the cityscape, um, a lot of it has to do with reacting to what happens on paper. And I did see that some people resonated with that idea. You have to really closely observe it and fix things accordingly. You won't always, you'll never control what happens on paper, but the only thing you can do is control your reaction to it, right? I hope that makes sense. If you enjoyed this one, as always, check out my frustration free watercolor course. The link is always in the description box below. If you really want to let go and enjoy the painting process, explore processes from light to dark, from dark to light. Uh, and I will mention once again, I am working on a course for you about uh, realism in watercolor. It's a bit of a complex one, so there's a lot of work to do. Uh, but I think it's going to be my best so far. So thank you so much. We'll see you again in the next video real soon.